Okay. Our next speaker is uh, someone who really needs no introduction because his name has only been referenced, I think, a hundred times already today. Uh, but I will introduce Dr. John Violente. John is a, uh, a researcher extraordinaire who is, uh, his expertise is in law enforcement. He spent 20, almost 25 years, 23 years in New York State Police. And uh, then he got his doctorate. And uh, in 1999 was funded, called the B-COP study, which I'll let him explain a little bit. But uh, really, we all look at that study as being the model for us, uh, Dr. Vila is uh, involved. NIOSH, uh, it, it's a major effort uh, on, by NIOSH to fund and follow outcome as well of this study. So uh, I'm going to let John talk a little bit about that. But today, mostly, he's going to be talking about suicide, stress and suicide in law enforcement and specifically in corrections. So, uh, John, thank you so much for making the travels out here. He was in Victoria two weeks ago, New Orleans last week, and now Portland for eight hours. So, John, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm quite honored to be here. Uh, corrections is a new area for me. Uh, we, uh, the worst experience we've ever had with corrections, of course, was Attica, during the Attica riots. And uh, our guys, our people, went in there, and uh, you all know the story about Attica, I'm sure. But there was a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of PTSD that resulted out of that. And um, it's still under review uh, by many uh, legal authorities. Um, BCOPs. Uh, interesting study. Back in 1999, uh, BCOP stands for the Buffalo Cardio Metabolic Occupational Police Stress Study. I can't even say it. That's so long. <laughs> and um, Brian Veal, of course, uh, joined us with NIJ, along with NIJ, to do the fatigue and uh, shift work uh, part of our study, and we were really grateful for that as well. Uh, NIOSH has been great to us. The people in Morgantown have been great. Uh, they're just wonderful people to work with. And uh, uh, we, we do a lot of good work, and we diversify very well. Uh, back in, um, uh, back in uh, 1986, I'm kind of dating myself a bit here, but back in, in 1986, uh, a, a colleague of mine uh, named John Vina uh, and I decided to look at police mortality. We wanted to see what police officers were dying from. And this initial study was a 40-year police cohort looking at the deaths of police officers for over a period of 40 years. And we found a lot of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we found a lot of cancer, particularly cancers of the, of the, uh, the colon and uh, uh, liver cancer and uh, cirrhosis of the liver and so forth. Um, then we got down to the, the, the suicide. And we looked at the suicide, and we found that the suicide rate in our sample was three times that of the general United States population. It's kind of piqued our attention. And at that point, we decided, well, you know, we need to look into this further. And uh, we've been doing that ever since. I've done a lot of work on suicides. I've done a lot of work on cardiovascular health and police with B-COPs. And the more and more, the more work I do, the more I understand that uh, law enforcement officers, and that includes corrections, and police, and fish and game wardens, and, and everyone else who enforces the law, uh, all experience uh, a lot of stress in their work. And that stress is not isolated with them. That stress goes home with them, and that stress affects their families as well. When I look at total worker health, I often think about, the thing I think about the most is the effect on the family that law enforcement work has and uh, what these folks bring home and how it affects the relationships. But getting back to suicide, I think uh, what I'm going to do essentially here is to give you an overview of, of suicide um, and then in particular give you some information on corrections officer suicide. 
One million people die by suicide, according to the World Health Organization, 2007. 2,700 per day, 10 to 20 million people attempt suicide. It's the leading cause of death in one third of all countries in this world. 54% of all violence related deaths from suicide. And it, it's a major health problem. Among the 10 leading causes of death in this country, suicide is number nine. And ironically, it's the most preventable death of all of the types of death. That's what's so sad about suicide. It's mostly preventable. 31,000 people die in the US each year. The rate is around 11.4 per 100,000. 80 per day, one person every 15 to 20 minutes. Four times of the completions of suicides are men, and three times the attempts are by women. Suicide doesn't care who you are, what color you are, where you come from. It's non-discriminatory. It crosses all boundaries. And again, it's the most preventable form of death. Some concepts, it's multi-determined. It's not one thing, it's many things. You know, it could be financial, it could be family relationships, it could be divorce, it could be separation, it could be uh, trouble with children, trouble at work, it could be being involved in a shooting or traumatic event. All of those things add up and the effects of these things are cumulative. And they can get you a point where what I like to call the stress bucket, where you get to a point where your bucket's full, not your bucket list, your stress bucket, and you get, it gets to a point where, where it gets full and your ability to cope, to deal with that, diminishes. And sometimes people turn to maladaptive means of dealing with that. Some turn to alcohol, some turn to other drugs, some turn to suicide. So it's a matter of being able to adapt to this and some people just can't do it. There are multiple ways to deal with suicide. Um, education is probably a good one. Awareness is a good one. Uh, the problem with corrections and the problem with law enforcement that I know, that I have experienced, that I study about, is that we can't get these folks to get help. It's that image thing. You know, I'm made of steel. I am Superman. I am superwoman, I do not need help, I give help. We've got that ethos in, in law enforcement, and it's not only in police, it's in corrections officers as well. And you people who study corrections know what I'm talking about when I mention that. So th there's a difficult, dealing with the culture is a difficult thing, but there are ways to deal with it if we can get them to go for help. I think most suicide people don't want to die, they're ambivalent, uh, they want to find a way to live, uh, it's up to us, if we can, to give them that way to live. Now, what the, what the problem is, is that uh, suicidal individuals get into a, a state of what we call cognitive restriction. And what that means is they're in this tunnel. And they're in this tunnel, and on one side of the tunnel is the unendurable psychological pain they're dealing with, and on the other side of the tunnel is the only way out of the tunnel, and that's suicide. There's no other way to deal with it. So you get in that state of mind and you have nowhere to go. And it's up to us, the, the psychologists and the people out there to find them alternate ways to deal with their problems so they can get out of the tunnel. The difficult thing about suicide is that the final decision rests with the person. No matter what we do, and we, we just can't save everybody because it rests with the person, the final decision. That individual must make that decision. If you reduce the risk factors, you reduce the stress. And you reduce the risk and you enhance protective factors. And protective factors are something I think that we need to study more. The resilience factor, establishing resilience in individuals, establishing resilience in the organization. Resilience is social. It's not only an individual personality factor. It's a social factor. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We just finished a study for the Institute of Medicine to help establish resilience in um, Homeland Security. And that's a group that has like 25 different organizations in it. 
And you talk about a difficult job uh, to try to set up something to establish a resilient and ready workforce in Homeland Security. But it's so important that the Institute of Medicine decided that they, we ought to do it. So establishing, looking for things to protect people, I think is very important. Tom Joyner is a, a, a theorist in, in, in suicide, a, a big name. He said that suicides involves uh, what he called a psychic. ache. It's like having a headache or a stomach ache. You have a psychic, ache. And that can lead you, to, certainly, to, to hurt. Hopelessness, uh, not being able to find a way out, unbearable psychological pain, cognitive restriction I talked about, uh, the ability to solve problems. People who are suicidal have a poor problem of solving ability. That's why they can't get out of this tunnel I'm talking about. Feeling that you're a burden to other people, people who have terminal illness, for example. Uh, thwarted belongingness, the isolation factor comes in here. And this goes all the way back to Durkheim, who said that if you're isolated in society, you know, you're more likely to commit suicide. Here we have a group of people. We have corrections officers. We have law enforcement people who are in this sort of separate community, if you will, this isolated community. They're cohesive in their group, but it's almost like the public is something out there that they can't integrate themselves into society as well because they're in this particular group of enforcement. And of course, acquiring the ability to, for self-injury, and that involves having a gun and habituation to pain. Um, life is cheap in correction institutions. Police officers and law enforcement people have a very, diff a very different conception of death than most of us have. They're jaded. You know, it's, it's easy to get jaded to death when you see it all the time in a period of 20 to 25 years. And you get to feel that it's easy to die. It's simple. All I have to do is pull the trigger and it's over. So that's sort of a, an occupational hazard thing that, that, that pops up in individuals like officers. Uh, really quickly, uh, you probably all know these, but I, I just want to go over them quickly. Previous suicide attempts, the most highly regarded risk factor in suicide. Previous suicide in the family, despair, hopelessness, depression. Depression is a big. Increased alcohol is big. Uh, family issues are big in, in law enforcement. Financial crisis, departmental charges are big in law enforcement, IA investigations and so forth. Warning signs of making a will where you never thought about that before. Um, giving away prized possessions, we've heard of these. Religion, changes in religions, ideas about religions, increased anger. Complaints of your coworker that you're acting strange, that you're quiet, that you used to come in and be a big joker in a locker room, now you say nothing. You just walk out and you look like the last rows of summer, if you will, when you walk out the door. Complaints by citizens, violence, uh, police violence, if you will. Change in work habits, any change is out of the ordinary. Change of personality is a, an indication something's going on in, your, in this individual. Now, very specifically, uh, looking at corrections, I think Unfortunately, there hasn't been many studies in suicide in corrections. I only know of two main ones, two major ones that I know of. There are a lot of studies on occupations and suicide, but there's nothing that specifically focuses on corrections. First of all, let me talk about the dilemma of image. Commissioner Morrow talked about calling corrections officer guards. There's not a greater insult you can do <laughs> than call a correctional officer, a guard. He's a law enforcement officer. Guards are people who help little kids across the street at a school crossing. Okay? Not that those are bad people. They're very good people. But these people are not guards. Okay? They enforce the law. And they enforce the law by taking care of our correctional institutions. So this image problem, I think, pervades a, a lot of corrections officers. A feeling of not being appreciated, of being think thought of as, as something lowly other than uh, a police officer. Got to deal with a lot. 
uh, add that to the equation, put their, put their job in that equation, and you know, it certainly puts a lot of pressure on them. Uh, they're exposed to most of the dark things in life. Life is cheap behind the walls, and uh, you get into that culture. If you spend eight to 12 hours a day in this culture with rapists and murderers and, and robbers, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a tough life. Are you expected to go home and drop that baggage, or are you going to take it with you? You know, and that's the question. Most of the research in correctional facilities has been on inmates, on why inmates commit suicide, and that's, that's okay. You know, we need to do that. But what about the other side? We also need to look at that, you know, and, and that's what we need to look at here. The first study that I knew of that specifically focused was that of Steve Stack, uh, Steve um, and Studos. They did a study way back in, in 57, and what, essentially what he found, and this is just the data he, he had here, but essentially what he found that controlling for other variables and adjusting for age and race and sex and all that, that the odds ratio, the odds of a, an, a corrections officer committing suicide was 39% greater than uh, 20 states involved in a, a NIOSH database. I'll mention that a little in uh, one minute here. So if you're a corrections officer, by virtue of your occupation, you have a 39% greater risk of completing suicide. The New Jersey Commission on Law Enforcement Suicide also did a study and in, in 2012, and they found that New York, New Jersey corrections officers committed suicide at double the rates of police officers in the general population. From 03 to 7, 25 to 64 males per 100,000, the rates for COs was 34.8. For police, it was 15.1. And for the general New Jersey population, it was 14.0. Very high rates. Now, the numbers of suicides are not big, but the odds, the, the important thing here is the risk involved with this occupation was greater for corrections officers and it was for police in the general population. What were the circumstances of these suicides? Crisis in the last two weeks. The highest one was crisis in the last two weeks, 32% that happened to. Physical health problem was a high one. Intimate partner problem, a high one. Left a suicide note, and various other things that went on here. The gun suicides, of course, are, are probably the most prominent in law enforcement, the use of the gun, the firearm. Um, the availability of, of, of means, it, it's simple to figure that out. Now, I know there are a lot of correctional institutions, including Attica, where uh, inmates or uh, corrections officers don't carry in guns. They, they're not allowed to have guns in there, uh, other than emergency, of course, emergency situations. But um, uh, I think many of them own their own, and uh, the guns seem to be the way that officers tend to commit suicide. Um, we just did a study. We just completed a study, which we published, uh, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, six months ago, maybe, um, on correction suicide. On, generally, it was on law enforcement suicide. And this was a, uh, a study based on a CDC NIOSH uh, database called the National Occupational Mortality Surveillance Database. And it was for the years 2003, 2004, and 2007. And uh, this database had death certificates for 1.46 million people, all working populations. Uh, and we looked at the proportionate mortality ratio analysis of suicide. That's the proportion of suicide in one population over the proportion of suicide in another population. And that's statistical stuff that I don't talk about much. But anyways, that's what it is, and that's what it does. And this is what a PMR is, what I just said. Anyways, <laughs> what we found is that the mortality ratio for a corrections officer, they had a 41% greater risk of committing suicide than did the rest of the 1.46 million working population that they were compared to. 
That's a high risk. That's a very high risk. White males, of course, win the battle. White males had a 34% greater risk, which is true in society as well. All these rates are adjusted, by the way, for race, sex, and gender, and ethnicity, and so forth. There are less than five deaths in, America, in uh, African American males and less than five in Hispanic males, so they're not reported. Uh, NIOSH does not report those because of confidentiality reasons. In terms of Caucasian females within the correction system, there were nine deaths. Uh, that was not a significant, um, a, a significantly higher rate than the general population. Of course, there's very few deaths for suicide. And there are less than five, again, uh, less than five suicides in African-American females in the correction system. So here again, in this rather simple study we did, we found that uh, corrections officers are at a higher risk for suicide. Now, you might say we already know that, uh, but how much do we know? How much do we know? We don't know what the suicide rate is in reality because no one's really studied it that much. Maybe that's something we need to do first. And then what's the ideology behind those suicides? You know, that's the big question. How are we going to prevent that? Well, I like to talk about stress. And I think stress is a potential correlate of suicide. I always thought so. Uh, having been through that experience, I, I think <coughs> how you deal with stress and, and what you do with yourself in your life uh, makes a big difference. There are some officers who deal very well. And I always thought that corrections officers and police officers and law enforcement people were pretty resilient people. You know, they, most of them handle this job very well, but there are those that don't. And, and the stress that gets to them makes a difference. Any organization or social structure which has one group of people and that don't want to be there and the other group that keeps them there, of course, is going to be under stress. As we found out with ECOP, stress uh, transcends environmental boundaries and affects us both psychologically and physiologically. The metabolic syndrome, that subclinical cardiovascular disease dilemma that people have in this country is quite prominent among our police officers, especially with those with high post-traumatic stress disorder or high levels of stress or high levels of biomarkers like cortisol that signify stress in the body, dysregulation of, of systems in the body that mess us up and cause disease. Mary Storr, to be honest, uh, was the first study I saw on this, and she found that officers do have, are having high levels of stress. Uh, corrections officers are often associated with poor training, high turnover rates, and, and many of these stuff you know already. One of the things about turnover rates, I think, uh, I think in, the, in, the, in the lesser, lower level, small correctional facilities, I think you see more of that. I'm not sure, but I think you do, and I think what happens here is uh, people don't have the ability to, to become cohesive because people are moving in and out all the time. And, you know, that can affect how well you're doing your work, how well your comrades uh, work with you. They seem to be very dissatisfied workers by, by some researchers' uh, views. And uh, we know that the stress is severe and, and wide in this job. What are the predictors of stress? Age, gender. Have we ever looked at correctional officer women? Has anybody looked at that? I think not. You know, I think, what do they experience? So they're in a male-dominated occupation. They're, they're doing the same thing that the males do, but they have this added thing of gender differences to deal with. What about families? What about children? Who's taking care of the children when the women are working night shifts? When you have two people, which happens in policing, as Brian will tell you, you have two people working as police officers, the man and the wife. One's working at midnight, one's working a day shift. How do you deal with that? High demands and low control. You know, Karasak's work that says that this causes stress. Demands at a job, you have no control over them. Administrative stress. We're finding in B-Cops that administrative stress is one of the biggest stressors that police officers talk about. The administration does not care. The administration does not support. And that causes a lot of stress for them. Shift work, 
Again, Brian Vila and, and I and, and our NIOSH crew have found over and over again that shift work is affecting these officers psychologically and physiologically. Having high level security, having high contact, uh, dangerousness, uh, the commissioner talked about dangerousness. Yeah, it's a very dangerous job. You're in there without a gun. Maybe you got some less lethal weapons with you, but you're in there without a gun. And I think uh, Ms. Garcia talked about her job there and how she was warned how dangerous this job is. And of course, social support, again, is very crucial by the administration. Inmate assaults have increased uh, at the same period. The number of correctional officers have not, so the economy has taken its toll. The offender does not, uh, who's in, the lifer, the, the, the person that's in for life, for murder or whatever, why should they care what you do to them? Can't put them in jail anymore. They're in there already for life. You know, so there's this idea that we can do whatever we want and nothing more they can do to me. So I think you have a lot of individuals in that uh, situation. Spillover, we talked about already that uh, it's just one of those jobs. And like law enforcement altogether, it's one of those jobs that spills over into your family. And uh, in our NYPD study, we found that about 60% of the suicides were related to personal relationships. 60% personal relationships. Divorce, separation, family fights, um, infidelity. All of these things add up. Correctional Management Institute in Texas, they found, and these are all studies that find that there is an impact in your home life uh, from this job. So there, there's a lot of displacement of anger, uh, a lot of I don't want to talk about this, I don't want to take this stuff home, I shot myself off in communications when I get home. Um, this idea of hypervigilance, Kevin Gail Martin talks about being keyed up and full of adrenaline on a job, and you go home, and it's like a roller coaster. You have to go back down, but you go down, you go way down, you know. You might drug out on alcohol. You might sit in front of the TV. You don't want to do anything with your family. You're just, like, totally out of it, man. Next day, you, you crave to get back with the adrenaline. You go back to work and the adrenaline pumps again. You go home, you go down the tube again. It goes over and over. And he says it's like a mad roller coaster ride, this hypervigilance of, of um, adrenaline. We found that some officers who retire cannot get rid of that, that they've become adrenaline junkies. And that lack of excitement, that lack of getting back to adrenaline has affected their lives and caused depression. Post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of that and know about it. It's just uh, the exposure to traumatic events, which happen a lot within the correctional facilities. This is Criterion A from the American Psychiatric Association. And basically, it's an exposure to a traumatic event or a witnessing of a traumatic event uh, or uh, your self-integrity being uh, threatened in some way. But I'm not going to go over that too much. It's, there's about uh, five or six different criteria for PTSD. Move it. <laughs> Basically, PTSD is involved in intrusive memories, flashbacks, avoidance of things that resemble the trauma, and physiological arousal, which is probably the most dangerous in our view. Uh, the, the inability to sleep, uh, fatigue, having terrible nightmares about the event, uh, the adrenaline, the cortisol dysregulation that goes on in the body from PTSD. We found an association between high PTSD symptoms and lower brachial reactivity. Brachial reactivity, your brachial artery essentially, does not uh, expand the way it should. And this is an early sign of cardiovascular disease. PTSD and depression contribute to suicide behavior. There's been some research on that. Uh, longitudinal study found that those who had 
either full or partial PTSD are associated with elevated suicide rates, and it's no surprise. Study again by uh, Spinaris and others found that uh, in overall, there was an overall prevalence of 27% of corrections officers experienced PTSD. The more exposure to work violence they had, the higher the levels, higher levels of depression, more absenteeism, health service utilization, health conditions, and so forth, and lower levels of pro-health behaviors. You know, when people, when people get stressed out or when they have PTSD, they forget about the exercise. They forget about the diet. All they worry about is getting rid of this terrible feeling, this depression, this, this uh, flashbacks that they're getting about this traumatic event and so forth. And that opens them up for obesity. It opens them up for uh, the lack of sleep and, and fatigue you know, that Brian talks about. This is kind of a chart of what, he, what they did. And 27% of the total sample had PTSD. 31% of the males did. 22% of the females did. Security staff had 34%, and all of those staff had 23%. Something else we forget. There are civilians, as Mrs. Garcia said, there are civilians who work in the correction facility. Do we care about them as well? Do they, too, experience distress? She worked in this facility, and she was told, you better watch out. Does that not prepare you for some stressful days? Uh, it's always in the back of your mind that this can happen to you. Uh, so I think we need to care for them as well within these walls. Seeking help uh, is bound by the culture, the culture that's impossible to change unless you know something I don't know. It's, it's, we, we've tried with the police, it's, it's, and I think you've had some success with that uh, with, your, with your work, but uh, it's still, it, it's a bear. It's hard to change the culture. I don't want to be seen as weak, and this is uh, Audrey Hogue's study from the New England Journal of Medicine. My unit will treat me differently. Members of my unit will have less confidence in me. My leaders will blame me. It's going to hurt my career. I'm not going to make sergeant or lieutenant. These are the things we hear. I can't get time to go for treatment. These are excuses. It's difficult to get an appointment. I don't trust mental health officials, professionals. That's a big one with the police. They're afraid that they're going to, the term is blow them in. They're going to tell the chief. Um, I don't know where to get help. I don't have adequate transportation. The big rule is whatever you do, don't ask for help. Um, it's not for lack of social skill. It's fear. It's fear. Fear beats logic three to one. Fear beats logic. Asking for help is a death sentence. I do not need help. I give help. Okay. That's the ethos in, in law enforcement. Now, the question is how do you break through that? You know, that's the big question. Officers are about to commit suicide. Correctional officers are at least likely to ask for help. We need to go out and get them. The problem with suicide prevention is that it has been reactive. I talked to a lot of police chiefs, and guess what? They start a suicide awareness and mental health awareness program after the suicide occurs because it upset their department so much. We need to be proactive, and the International Association of Chiefs of Police has published a doctrine that they will become proactive in law enforcement suicide. That's the way to do it. That's the way we need to prevent it. We need to get in at the beginning. Uh, I used to like Barney Fife. You remember Barney Fife from Mary Mary? His famous quotation, he's got to nip it in the bud, you know? <laughs> nip it in the bud. I still see him doing that on TV. And that's what you need to do. You need to start at the beginning. Uh, let's go back. Start at the top by recruiting leaders who care. John Jones, the chief of police in, in Canada, said that um, leaders have a duty of care, that they have a moral and ethical obligation to care for their people. And if they don't, then they're not being ethical leaders. Institutionalize earning warning and intervention protocols to treat at-risk officers. 
awareness campaigns. Don't, don't hang an AAP poster on the wall and gather dust. You need to go out and get these people you know, to get the word out that it's okay to go for help. If you don't do that, they're never going to come to you. Audit your programs and determine uh, whether or not they include suicide prevention and mental health wellness. Invest in training, agency-wide training. Leaders, middle management people especially need awareness and they need to know what to do if an officer comes to them and said, I'm thinking about killing myself. Well, one of the things that the commissioner said is there's a mandate for an automatic report. That's true, it probably, and, and you have to do that, but get the help for the individual as well and get that individual back to work. It costs a lot of money to lose a corrections officer, to replace that person. Should begin at the academy when you have these young, vibrant corrections officers coming in and you need to tell them ahead of time what to expect, what PTSD is, what stress is, how it's gonna affect their family life, and how to avoid these things. Include the family in training. You know, th there's, of all the people that can help prevent suicide, the family's probably one of the big ones. You have, and most people in, in their lives have a group of three to five people who are good buddies, they're good friends, and the family is also a good friend. I've talked to officers before and they said, you know, I would have killed myself if it wasn't for my wife. Coming in that bedroom, taking that gun out of my hand, said, come on, buddy, you're going for help. And, you know, that, that's the difference. Family is a great supportive unit. So they need to understand what this job does to their spouses. What do you do after a suicide? Another big problem we had in law enforcement, and people don't know what to do. Uh, should we have a military funeral for the officers is generally what happens in, when officers die, or should we not? Should we go in uniform or should we not? Uh, it causes a lot of confusion and morale problems if you don't know what to do in a case of a suicide. So have something ready, have policy. Train all corrections officers, train as many officers, and friends and family members as possible. Train at all levels. Psychologists. There are many psychologists out there who uh, are not aware of suicidal protocols, especially they work with cops and, and law enforcement people. I think that every psychologist who becomes a police psychologist should go through ride-alongs and walk-alongs and go along with a corrections officer for a week or two to see what they go through, to understand their job. Um, again, talking to officers, you know, I went into the psychologist's office and he or she's telling me things that have nothing to do with my job, nothing to do at all. They don't understand. Okay. So you need to train them as well as to what the, the, uh, per, you know, the, the parameters are of the, of the correctional occupation. Research on, uh, we need more research on minorities and female corrections officers. I, I said that before and I think it's true. We don't know anything about them. Uh, work home conflict, total, total work health situation, I think mandates that we look at the home and the effect on family. Coping abilities, um, Things more to explore, I guess. Uh, increasing involvement in decision making. Uh, again, you know, one of the things that Karasek said was that if you're not involved in the system, if you have no control over your work, that you're more likely to feel stress. Well, how do you give people control over their work? You, you let them help you with decisions that affect their work. Who knows best? The person where the rubber meets the road knows best, you know. And they, they're the ones. We saw that with the Border Patrol down in Nogales, Texas, uh, uh, trying to deal with uh, the influx of um, immigrants, the undocumented immigrants coming into the United States. And um, what they had to go through with these people, you would not believe. Uh, I, it's, it's really a difficult job. And um, 
You know, they, they needed to let their supervision know what they were doing and how they could do it better to protect the, the, the immigrants and themselves. Contact hours and things that can be evaluated. And, uh, we need some objective measures in this job of corrections which measure biological factors. It, it, we've come to a point, I think, in research where we are now very interested in biology and genetics and a lot of other things that uh, are important and that stress, stress kind of messes up, if you will. Okay. Um, Break them out by facility, job role type. I think every correctional institution is a culture in and by itself. It's not all fits one. You know, it's like medicine today where we're, uh, we're developing medical techniques that are individuals, for individuals, not for groups of people. Uh, it's the same with institutions. Everyone's different. You know, when you get to a different level of corrections, uh, things change. I think uh, in concluding, I didn't even get a five-minute warning. Well, I'm doing good here. Uh, in concluding, I think changing the culture is essential. Get, a, get rid of that Superman effect that um, I can't be vulnerable the big price that corrections officers pay is that they're human beings. They, they need to realize that. They have feelings like everybody else. And they can't let those feelings show in their work. So what do they do with them? Where do they put them? And lastly, uh, a quote from uh, the movie Platoon. Um, the enemy did not fight us. We fought ourselves. The enemy is within us. No, and that's, that's the truth. Okay. There's no way to easily solve this problem of suicide. Uh, unfortunately, I think, uh, as we've heard from other presenters, that it's increasing. The commissioner talked about four suicides and 4,500 people. By standards, that's a lot. That's a high rate. Uh, there's not much we can do at this point other than to start our awareness programs. I know of training programs. We use different training programs and protocols to teach suicide to our law enforcement officers. Uh, we use gatekeeper style uniform, uh, gatekeeper style training. Uh, everybody should have this. You don't have to be a psychologist or a, or a professional to prevent suicide. You just need to know about it and what the signs and signals are, and that way you can prevent it. So again, thank you very much for inviting me to Portland. Uh, I like the west part of the country. It's nice out here. I'm not going back. <laughs> John, we, have, we have time for one, one question, and then John is going to be leading uh, the panel this afternoon, and we'll all get an opportunity to sit down. We'll have three 30-minute panels, but John, but yeah, one question. Not even a question. I just want to say thank you so, so much because um, I've been in the Department of Correction in Connecticut for going on approximately eight, 19 years this year and started as a correctional officer. I'm a lieutenant now, but everything you said hit the nail hmm. on the head. Hmm. And if people really knew what we go through, honestly, it's like touch me right now. That's all I wanted awesome. to say. Thank you.